Um, and now I wanted to introduce Sarah. Uh, last time I saw Sarah was, I think, at the Whaley's. Um, <laughs> and she, like, absolutely crushed it with her, with her talk. And I was like, okay, like, we were decided we wanted to do Ag Creative Max. Like, we need to get Sarah um, because it was amazing. So, um, yeah, I'll just give her a little intro. Sarah's uh, a consumer behavior analyst, performance creative consultant, and founder of HG Performance Creative. Um, and, yeah, I'll let her take it from here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be super fun for me because I've actually been off of social media for two weeks, just doing like a detox, a little bit of dopamine detox, which has been amazing. Um, but this is like, okay, I'm ready to get back into it. So this is really, nice. I also have to follow Morella, which is going to be hard because oh, this woman knows her stuff. So, okay. Today, we are going to talk a whole bunch about psychology and creative. So let me share my screen here. <laughs> This is going to be super fun because I, I think there's a whole lot that we can talk about. Psychology gets really, really deep. Um, let me know if you guys can't see this. Hopefully you can. Um, it's quite interesting when you get down into the nitty gritty of the brain and how it actually sees ads and how it processes the different elements that are actually going on within your creative itself. So today I want to teach you guys a little bit about how to kind of unlock that performance with the emotional triggers your customers already have and use that to your advantage. So. Let's just jump right into it. I think a lot of people probably assume that this is what Sarah does on a daily basis, which is just a whole bunch of like mad scientist kind of stuff where I'm taking a ton of psychology, trying to distill it all down into like itty bitty pieces. And it's really complex and it's super complicated because it has to do with the brain. Uh, in reality, this is all we're trying to do when it comes down to using psychology in your ads. The only thing we need to remember is we are taking what we know about the brain, putting it into an ad so that we speak to the subconscious, the parts of the subconscious that are going to like that piece of that ad the most. So very simplified version. We're not trying to get too complex, especially when we start adding in more, I, what would you call it, more like complicated psychology, uh, like tactics and hacks. I, I want to really, really kind of push this for you guys that like it's not hard to add these into your ads and to see better performance from those um, it just takes a little bit of time to learn what we're trying to produce so before we jump into the ads I think it's really important if you saw the whalers or if you've seen me talk anywhere else I usually cover this part first um, but I like to do this because everybody needs more knowledge about the brain I think so when we talk about how the brain actually sees ads we want to start with kind of foundational how the brain processes anything at all so 95% of our processing power comes from the subconscious mind. This is the one that's very, very old. It's often called the lizard brain. Um, it's very reactive, sometimes called irrational or emotional brain. Uh, this is the one that's just firing on all cylinders. It is the fastest processing power you have inside your mind. And this is where 95% of our decisions are being made on a daily basis. On the opposite side, the conscious mind is only making about 5%. Uh, and this guy is pretty slow. <laughs> He's very logical, very calculated. He likes to take his time, likes to get all the information in first, and then go into actually processing and making decisions. So just as kind of a visual, this is how the conscious mind sees things. Very calculated, right? Like we want to make sure that we're making a very good decision, very slow working very hard to make a, a good decision over time, but it just takes a long time. In contrast, your subconscious mind is doing this all day long, every single day. Conscious is processing about 11 million bits of information per second. And that's from a whole myriad of things. So the the I want you guys to take away that your subconscious mind really is the boss here. This is the one that's doing all of the work to process things. And in general, it's just a recorder. So for consumers, all this brain is supposed to do is take in information from everything that you're seeing on a daily basis, all of the experiences you have, relationships you've been in, products you've sampled, those types of things, everything, and just keep it in a box, record it for future use, basically. And the reason it's doing this is because it's trying to tell what things are most important to keeping it alive. <laughs> and then it will send a message to the conscious brain once it sees something it likes, and it will tell the brain to stop. So for instance, if you see an ad uh, and that ad happens to have pizza in it and it's lunchtime, you haven't had anything that morning, maybe you skip breakfast, whatever it is, the subconscious is keeping track of all of that and understands that you're low on glucose, you're gonna need to eat soon. So it will send a message to the conscious brain and tell that brain to stop. Now, 
once it does that, you get what you need as a human, which is nourishment, food, pizza, right? In context of ads, though, this is really fascinating. And it gets deep down into kind of how the brain works on an emotional level. Because what the brain is actually doing when it sees ads, for instance, an ad about coffee, it will take that and compare it to all the other instances of coffee it's ever come in contact with. And it will do that within milliseconds. I mean, this guy is screaming fast, right? It's doing that for every single ad it sees. And it's taking this in context of what you want to obtain <laughs> as a human as a whole. So every goal that you have in your life that you want to try and, and go forward with or trying to, to get to or trying to like climb the ladder, it's doing this every single time. It's making decisions based upon is this coffee emotionally relevant to what I'm trying to do as a human? The interesting part about this is the brain really is an emotional being. And the experience you have as a human really does come into play with how you make decisions and how you purchase things in general. So every experience you have, even if it doesn't seem like it would connect to some of the ads or some of the, you know, the promotions that you're seeing, all of your experience as a human is coming into play when you start trying to make decisions on ads. So even the ones that are, are integral to what you're trying to do now, who you are as a person or who you think you're gonna be, comes down to the subconscious mind and the emotional needs of that mind itself. So keep that in mind as we go along that every single customer is making an emotional decision based upon what the subconscious deems is necessary. So we're gonna go into two different things today. The very first one we're going to talk about psychology and creative and this one is going to go deep into some of my favorite uh what what's termed as a heuristic this basically means it's a cheat code for the brain heuristics are just shortcuts that every single human on the planet uh has inside their mind to help make decisions faster and then we're going to go into a little bit of creative strategy not we're not going to go super deep into that because that's obviously a whole nother topic but in general, I want to talk about psychology hacks today because I want to get you guys something that you can use this week to boost your ads and to get better performance out of them. So these are the top five that I use all the time. You'll notice that there's something not on this list and not social proof, authority proof, <laughs> urgency. Those are fantastic. Uh, and yes, they are heuristics. The brain does use those to try and make decisions quicker. But I, I tend to lean a little bit away from things that are overused. Uh, especially in performance advertising, because you get to a point where so many people are using the same exact tactics that you start to dull the performance of them across industry. So I tend to look elsewhere. And this is kind of important because I, I think a lot of people think that there's just a few of these kind of hacks that we can use, psychology hacks like urgency, you know, social proof. There's hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of different heuristics that you can use to help boost your ads. So these are the top five ones that I use all the time, and I'm going to teach you how to use them so that you can make better ads and see better performance. Anchoring effect is the first one. We'll talk about framing and how to use it linguistically with your actual copy. Uh, loss aversion is one of the best ones I've ever seen. This one I use constantly because it, it works super well, especially for any sort of product that uh, has kind of a negative connotation around it. Um, priming is huge. This one's going to be super fun too, because there's a lot you can do with priming to help people kind of push forward and get ready to make a purchase later down the road. And then herd mentality being the last one. So let's jump into it. Anchoring effect. The easiest way to describe this, they did a study on anchoring effect. Uh, this particular psychology heuristic basically means that we're taking a piece of information and we're presenting it as the foundational piece so that anything we compare it to seems like a good deal. <laughs> they often do this with price. Uh, and for this particular study, they found that when you presented a lower price to a consumer, the consumers expected the product, that's the next product they saw, to have a low price. So they had an anchor in their head that was just lower than normal. Once they got presented another product that was also in the same category, they just expected it to be a lower price. Same goes the opposite way. They presented these consumers with a higher priced product in the same category and then showed them the product they wanted them to purchase and consumers were ready and willing to actually spend more money because they had a higher price that was anchoring that other price that they were expecting. 
the easiest way to describe this, Billy does a great job about this. They, they're fantastic with theirs, um, especially because like their product is relatively cheap. <laughs> it's like a ten five dollar product, right? Like it's it's not super expensive, but they sell a lot of them. And the reason for this is because they're very good at anchoring. So in this ad, we see a price anchor here. Ten dollars is the anchor. Five dollars is the actual benefited price, right? Now for Billy. Uh, if I was going to come in and consult with them, I would probably tell them you're probably price anchoring too low because you give them a $10 price anchor means $5 looks like a good deal. You could probably price anchor at 15 and bump your price up to seven. You could price anchor at 12 and bump this price up to like nine, whatever it is. You can do some very interesting things with price. There, ah, pricing psychology is fascinating. I mean, there's so much you can do with numbers. It's not even funny. Um, but for Billy, they do this a lot in their ads and it works so incredibly well for them. Old school advertising did this a ton. And the interesting part about this is they didn't actually do it with a price. De Beers decided to do uh, the anchor with specific time frames. So for this ad, uh, they chose this frame of like, how can you make two months salary last forever? This two month salary is an anchor. So now they've given their customers a specific price, I mean, De Beers is nuts. Oh, what they did with these ads was freaking crazy. They've given their customers a specific time period of savings that they were supposed to save for this particular ring. So now, I mean, they ran these ads for months before they decided to actually fill out the prices for these particular diamond rings. But since they gave them an anchor of two months salary for the, for the actual customer base that they were going after, two months salary at the time was somewhere between like, 1200 to like 1500 bucks somewhere in there like you know to 2000 that's a lot of money at the time when they were running these ads which was i think 1980s was this one so in general you don't have to just stick with price anchors you can also stick with anchors that have to do with basically any sort of numerical number so for these guys it was two months salary and that one worked super super well um i couldn't find the original kfc ad for this but it was really sad so this one came off of a study that KFC did, um, I think it was in the Asian market, and they this was fascinating stuff. So they ran an ad that just said a deal so good you can only buy four. So the price anchor for them was this four, right? So they actually put a cap, not necessarily on like ah, this brilliant stuff they're doing here. They're actually combining two heuristics. So they were combining anchoring and they were combining urgency, right? So oftentimes when we use urgency, it comes out as limited time deal, or it's going to go away soon, or we sold out in a week. Anchoring and, and urgency actually work a lot better when you tell people that they can't have a lot of it. So if you haven't tried this tactic in your ads, I, I highly, highly suggest it because it's one of the best things I've seen in a long time. So for KFC, this right here, this buy four was the actual anchor that worked really well for them. And the, the study was nuts. They saw a 56% increase in purchases for their $1 chips, the actual product they were selling, based upon the fact that they told people you can only have four of them. If you limit the subconscious resources that this allowed to have, you can see some amazing behavior come out of that, just based upon the fact that people get upset when you tell them you can't have it. <laughs> so next one, let's go into framing effects. This one is like one of my favorite ones because there's so much you can do with this. Copywriters use this a lot. Uh, so for this particular study, they found that running an ad with a positive sentiment, which was more like reach your weight loss goals, had a powerful impact on all of their metrics that they were tracking for this particular consumer base. And then on the opposite side, they ran the same ad, which was you know, don't get left in the dust, like, you know, or, or don't gain more weight, those type of things, saw that all of their metrics dropped. The, the consumers were not purchasing. They were very upset. Like, they just had really low scores performance-wise. So how you say things is often more important than what you're trying to say, if that makes sense. We need to frame things in a way that suits our particular customer set best, right? We've got to be very careful about how we say it. I've, I've talked about this one a ton just because I love what I do. Huel did this. Um, I think this ad came out earlier this spring and I was like, holy crap, Huel, you're amazing. So they had this ad that just says, don't change your life, just change lunch. It was so incredibly well framed for this customer base because oftentimes when you're trying to lose weight, you feel very hopeless, right? Like I have to overhaul everything. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do this. Customers in this particular industry have a really hard time understanding what they're supposed to do. So this is very simple for them. The framing around this was just uh, fantastic. 
Uh, next example, this is one of the best ones I think I've ever found. 1920s has some really good ads. If you're looking to learn psychology-based ads, go to the 1920s because they were so literal. And interestingly enough, they were trying to use things that didn't make sense at all. Uh, and it worked. I mean, the way you structure your phrases and how you compare it to different things really does have a massive impact on the brain and how it interprets that ad. So for this particular customer, obviously they're selling cigarettes uh, and they, they had a claim here that was 20,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. This is what I found interesting though. It's toasted your throat protection against irritation against cough. So it... <laughs> They're literally saying like our cigarettes don't make you cough. It just it kind of cracked me up a little bit. Um, this though, the framing on this is is fantastic because they're basically saying that like our cigarettes are good for you, right? They they didn't change a ton about it. They added a little bit of authority proof in here and combined it with that framing to kind of make an ad that had a powerful powerful statement, which is like you won't cough if you smoke our our cigarettes. Last one here for WordStream. This this one was really good because it shows the juxtaposition between the two. So this is a positive way of saying things, and this is a negative way of saying things. Seems obvious, but there's one thing in here I want you guys to notice the most, and that's the fact that people skip the image. And I, oh, it drives me crazy. We are so concerned about what the copy says that we forget that the image is what the brain is processing first. So pro tip for everybody. The brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text. And as it's going through and doing that, it's taking the copy and the image and comparing them very quickly to try and see if there's cohesion, right? It's trying to see if they are working well together. If the image and the, and the, the text itself doesn't really work well together, if it's just, you know, we sell insurance and it's a picture of a dog, like people are going to be like, that doesn't make any sense. The brain will instantly just disregard it. It will scroll on. So very, very important when you do framing, don't just frame your, your copy well. Try and frame your images to the copy as well so that everything is kind of cohesive. Next one here, loss aversion. I love this one. This study was done uh, just recently, actually. And they found that this particular customer base, if the customer happened to be the type of person that really hated losing things, they were more likely to follow the crowd, specifically when it came to reviews reviews, which I thought was like mind blowing. So for this particular customer, they show them a couple different products. And in that time frame, they had already taken a test that basically said like, I don't like to lose things. <laughs> and for that particular customer who really hated stuff, who just had this big loss aversion, they were super careful about reading all the reviews and tended to just do whatever the reviews said. So obviously reviews are very, very important. But if your customer is already in this particular mindset and it's pretty easy to figure this out if you do any sort of post-purchase survey or any sort of like customer information gathering you'll figure this out pretty quick that some some customers really hate to lose stuff so Klarna did a good job with this uh because they took the risk out so oftentimes when you have somebody that's in like loss aversion mode they hate risk they hate it hate it hate it and they never want to take a risk on things so if you have a higher price product or specifically for SaaS it's very important to make sure that your customers feel like they're not going to take a risk on this. It's very easy. We're not going to just take your money, but you can try it out before you start to commit to this. So furnish now, pay later. Obviously, they're talking about like, just go ahead and furnish your apartment and then you can pay later if you download our app type of a thing. Uh, Dollar Shave Club just crushes this every time. Uh, obviously, they have a good benefit on here and this was off of their website from a long time ago, but this is what just ah, it was like so awesome how it works literally one sentence if you can make your uh claim i would say clear and like risk-free that that is like sweet spot for you guys so try really hard to make it the shortest you possibly can because that also tells the brain it's short so it must be easy the brain wants no risk and it wants ease when it comes to loss aversion so fantastic on their website here Last was a good ad from Spotify. Try premium free, obviously, for 30 days. Anytime that you can give people a free sample, they're, they're automatically going to feel a little less nervous, right? Loss aversion is one of those things where they just feel nervous all the time about the risk level. So fantastic way to use that. A uh, couple more here. So priming effect. I love this one. I can't get enough of priming because it scares the crap out of me as a human. It's just very terrifying. 
Uh, so priming is an effect that basically says you are being influenced by a whole lot of everything all on a daily basis throughout your entire environment. In fact, some things that you read, some things that you come into contact with or you interact with, they can have an effect on your entire day. Um, and if you have kids and, and, you know, the house is chaos or someone pooped on the floor that morning, you know what this is. Like it just, it affects your entire day, <laughs> even if you don't want it to. So they did a study a long time ago, um, which has been replicated a few times. This is an interesting one because there's some controversy around this, this study, which I kind of like. Um, they took a few consumers, a group of consumers, and they basically had them walk down a hall uh, where someone was sitting in the middle of the hall and basically tracking how fast they were going down the hallway. They would go into a room, they would read a list of words, and then they would walk back down the hallway. That was the entire study. They split these people into two groups. One group read a specific group of words that had to do with like older people. So b bingo was one of them. Florida was another one. It never said the word old, but it, the word list really had to do with older people. And then they tracked how they came down the hallway. And that particular group, very, very intensely, like high percentage numbers of this, walked slower down the hallway after reading a group of words that had to do with elderly or older people. In contrast, the group that read like younger words, like youth or those type of things, walked faster down the hallway. So these words that they're tracking and, and how they were trying to understand this was they were basically trying to see whether or not the words impacted your physical being after you read this particular group. Not so. Uh, and the reason there's controversy around that is even though it's been duplicated quite a few times, there's a lot of people that are trying to, to discredit this particular study. Uh, even though it has been replicated, just based upon the fact that they're not entirely sure that the word group, I guess, was well chosen, which I just think is funny. Uh, best example of these ads. I absolutely love Magic Spoon, always have. They prime so incredibly well. They choose their words very, very carefully, which is smart. They also prime visually. So this is a bowl that's actually filling up, right? It's not a full bowl that's going to gone. It's an empty bowl that's going to full, which is very different priming, right? Like your brain sees that kind of bowl of zero very differently as it's going through like full to empty, empty to full. So these guys are always just crush it. Like I can't even tell you how much I love their ads, but this is how we prime with visuals. And this is also how we prime with words, low carb, low calorie, zero sugar, natural flavors. None of that says cereal, but it's still priming the customer to understand benefits, benefits, benefits. Red Bull is one that does this very, very well. Uh, you never see Red Bull logos on pianos. Like you, ne you never see Red Bull on like flower pots. Like you don't see the Red Bull logo on anything that's not fat. So Red Bull has chosen their particular visual entity, uh, has specifically been chosen so that they always say we are fast, we are like, we get you in the zone, those type of things. So when we're going through and we're actually choosing different uh, visual elements, I want you guys to think about what do we actually represent and what can we visually capitalize on so that people will understand it faster. Because again, the brain is processing these images way faster than the text. So it's important that you choose those wisely. Coca-Cola did this really well with this ad as well. Uh, open the happy can. Uh, this is something called, and I say this word wrong every time, anthropo, anthrop anthropomorphism oh my gosh it's a really hard word for me to say for some reason Anthrop anthropomorphism basically means that we uh really love cute faces uh kawaii is really big about this and we will often see faces and and like characters and things that aren't actually real inanimate objects so this is a great way to actually prime the brain to understand what's actually in this can because coke is basically saying it's not just soda this is also going to make you happy right I'm trying to be cognizant of time. Uh, okay, <laughs> last one, herd mentality. This one I love because I think a lot of people don't think that they follow the herd when they actually do. And I, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies for this one. So I didn't include a study for this one just because I was like, gosh, there's so many. But TikTok, TikTok is like the epitome of herd mentality. And I love studying TikTok because it's just, there's something so like delicious about this app. So on TikTok, there's some interesting things that I think uh, a lot of advertisers do that they don't realize that like following these big, big trends that have been done again and again and again and again, that's herd mentality. 
So we even do it as marketers. Is we're following these trends because everyone else is doing it. So this like pack and order with me, very, very herd mentality. The interesting part is though, it still works psychologically. Uh, this one is ASMR, obviously. So they combined a few of these like mental heuristics. But the fact of the matter is, as people will follow this kind of like ASMR trend, they're following each other, right? So the consumers are following each other all across TikTok. And it, it goes deeper down into kind of like how people, uh, what's the word? How the brain actually wants to experience the world. So ASMR is one of the best examples of herd mentality just because people really, really love sounds of things on TikTok. Um, on top of that, I found this one was really interesting of this like satisfying is also another kind of herd mentality, basically because every human on the planet really loves satisfying things. And they studied this across the board that we just really love to watch things get filled up, which is just funny, especially if you can add like an interesting sound to it, like, and it's colorful and it's pretty satisfying things is very much herd mentality. Lots of people just follow everybody else as they're going through it. And then last one that I, I really loved on TikTok was this green screen. This didn't used to be a thing when TikTok first came out. Uh, it just started getting big sometime in the middle of the last year. And then everybody was doing it, uh, especially on the marketing side. Herd mentality. We're just, we're kind of following as, as things kind of come up in trend. The more people that get on the trend, the more people will follow. So herd mentality is, is so integral for any sort of, uh, I would say, trending content, especially on TikTok. So I think I have a few more minutes here. So we're going to go into some ad strategy really quickly for how to use these, right? So we just went through a couple different uh, psychology heuristics and kind of how to use them in ads, how other people have used them in ads. But I think it's important to kind of touch on a little bit the emotional side of the subconscious brain. And I like to teach this outside of how the brain works, um, mostly because I think people see the customer journey kind of like this, where there are specific stops that we're making along the way. They stop at TikTok, they'll stop at our website, they'll get on our newsletter, and then eventually they'll buy. This is what people think the journey looks like. It actually looks like this. <laughs> Oftentimes, consumers will have multiple touch points in one specific spot, say on TikTok or, or you know Google or wherever it is, YouTube, multiple, multiple times, and then loop back around to it several times as they're making the decision to actually purchase from you. And the reason they're doing this is because consumers are shifting their buying habits throughout the year and throughout their life. So constantly aging up into your demographic and aging out of your demographic. And it all just depends on where they are in life, who they are as people, where their brain is and what they're currently consuming. Uh, and it just depends. It depends on what age they are in particular. And it's quite interesting when you start to study generations and how the brain will start to kind of change what you need in life and what you want out of life as you age up. And it's our job as marketers to make sure that we're not just hitting like who they are, but also when they are in life. Uh, because our goal really is to kind of develop ads that, that prompt that specific response from the subconscious brain at scale. We want a lot of subconscious brains to understand what we're saying, take it into the like processing of, of the big mind, the boss, right? And then make a subconscious decision so that the conscious can actually purchase from us. How we do this is by leaning into the emotional motivators. So I talked a little bit about this um, at the Whaley's and a couple other different places, but there's nine different emotional motivators we use to purchase. Um, the heuristics we just talk, talked about come into play here, but they're actually second level. So the base level of every decision we make is emotional, right? So this is based off of a psychology framework developed by Will Leach, really good friend of mine, um, works for kind of like big, big brands out there, but his, his framework capitalizes on nine different emotions that we have. Sometimes they will combine to actually make the decisions that we're trying to make, especially when it comes to purchases. But once you can hit on one specific emotion, uh, usually I find about three when I'm doing um, research for, for brands. But if you can hit on that one specific emotion, you can actually build your ads so that it reads that way. All of your ads can talk to your consumers about their need for competence or their need for safety or acceptance or esteem. And it's pretty important to know which one is going to be most important for your customers because the creative strategy process that we're all talking about, uh, this is usually the one that I see presented, our research phase, ideation, production, doing the evaluation of the ads, and then going into any sort of iterations. That's only half of the puzzle. <laughs>
the second half of the puzzle is your ad strategy. And this is where heuristics come into play. This is where emotional needs come into play, the nine different emotions. And this is where strategy really needs to start with our emotional sentiment, our messaging that we're actually using to draw people in. Image selection is so incredibly important. What your image says will actually stop the brain faster than what your text says. The layout and the design is super crazy important. And then going into your iteration phase, these two work together. They've always worked together. They will never stop working together. And it's incredibly important to know how to do both and do both well, because this is how you build psychology-based creative. So once you find an ad, you'll be able to say, I know which image to pick. I know which copy we need to go after. I know what testimonial we need to look for. I know where to place elements. So psychologically, this is easy to process. I know how to reduce cognitive load so that the brain doesn't get tired. <laughs> this is how we start to create good ads so that the iterations of these ads also perform at scale. Because at the end of the day, all of these elements are going to work together, right? Every single piece of your ad is getting processed by the brain in a particular way by a particular person who has a goal that they need to solve. And all we're trying to do is make sure that we talk to the subconscious and present it something that it's going to love so that we can make more money and scale our brand. Thank you guys. Hopefully I was on time. I tried to talk fast. <laughs> that was amazing. That's what Thank we you. all want. Um, we've got one question in the chat here from Raphael. Um, is that if obviously like, you know, customers, consumer psychology is like a super, probably like deep, oh dark, my gosh, yes. you go down. And so <laughs> do you have any, um, do you have any like go-to books if someone wanted to level up kind of their knowledge of this uh, yeah. or anything else, even like Ted talks or anything like that? I have so, so many. Um, so obviously one of my favorite books, marketing to mind states that was written by Will Leach. Um, he's the guy that obviously built the psychology model for the nine different emotional motivators. That's my top book <laughs> in general, always. Uh, outside of that, um, Predictably Irrational was a really good one. That one, uh, I have to remember this guy's name. Um, Danny Rielli. Oh, of course, geez, I should not have forgotten that. Anyway, Predictably Irrational is probably one of my second favorites. He's just like, it, it will blow your mind once you start to to study how your brain works and, and how you make decisions because it just it's quite scary how little of our decisions are our decisions <laughs> right Be careful when you start studying it because you might start to get terrified because it, it really it's all emotional it's very reactive every choice we make is just very reactive so those are my top two outside of that youtube has a ton of really good ones on neuromarketing so if you go on youtube and just type in neuromarketing you'll find a really really good set of ted talks in particular that go through this topic so okay amazing and we have one other question from jess uh, i'm assuming that you did a dopamine <laughs> pack. <laughs> yes totally. i that. love this question it was weird like let me just tell you that was a really weird experience i didn't mean to it was more just like okay i'm slowing down some big projects so i think now's the time to just take some time off mm -hmm. so i decided to go complete dopamine fast so no tv no email no social media and like limited phone use um i did watch youtube i'm not gonna lie i did watch some youtube because i can't i just couldn't turn it off biggest thing that i found from that i felt sleepy earlier which is weird like i felt tired at about 9 45 whereas before i think because i was just like rolling my brain all day long i didn't usually fall asleep till like 10 30 11. so earlier sleep was interesting and then the next part for some reason i constantly felt like i had to check something like i was forgetting something and that kind of went away. So that like anxiety of what are you forgetting all day long just isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Downside though to dopamine fast, uh, I have a really hard time staying motivated. I'm just, Got it. now I'm to the point where I'm like, <laughs> I just don't want to do things. <laughs> Got I, it. Just, I don't know. I haven't checked anything in a while. It was interesting. I suggest everybody do it. Cool. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time and thanks for dropping all of the psychology yes. knowledge bombs uh, through the marketing lens.